Well, good evening and welcome to Woodman. We are so grateful that you are here with us today. My name is Matt. I serve as the campus pastor here at Rock Rim Inn. And if this is your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. We would love the opportunity to get to know you, um, connect with you, and help you find your best next step here at the church. And so after the service, please swing by Connect Central. If you go out these center doors and hang a left, you'll see our Connect team on your right-hand side, and we look forward um, to meeting you after the service. And as a church family, we have been praying for and we are expectant for how the Lord is going to move over Easter weekend. And if you call Woodman home, we would love your partnership in that for the sake of the gospel. Would love for each of us to continue praying for um, the Lord to move in mighty and powerful ways Easter weekend and be praying about who it is that the Lord may lay on your heart. Um, this Easter weekend, you never know the impact that you can have on someone's life by extending an invitation to attend one of our Easter services. And we would love you to consider serving. Um, there are plenty of ways to serve from our birth through fourth grade ministries. We're gonna teach the youngest amount, um, among us about the good news of the resurrection of Jesus, helping greet and usher the thousands of people that come in. There are plenty of ways to serve. As a reminder, we have two Good Friday services, and then we have five Easter weekend services, two on Saturday and three on Sunday, so there are a lot of options to choose from, ways to serve, more information about Easter and everything else that is happening here at Woodman, um, you can find in your weekend service guide via the QR codes or um, on the Woodman app. We're glad that you are here, and we're praying that our time together the Lord speaks to you um, and invites you to learn more about who he is, and we are different as a result of our time together. And so as we turn our attention to worship through song, um, praying that the Lord meets you and he is worthy of praise as we sing to him. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Um, church, I'm so glad you're here. It's so great to see you all. If we haven't met, my name is Casey. This is Jessa and Don and our wonderful worship team that's gonna help lead our time tonight. And I'm not sure what type of week you have had this week, um, but whatever it's looked like, just know that uh, you are welcome here tonight. Your journey is welcome here tonight because walking a life with Jesus is a journey. It, it is full of ups and downs and highs and lows, um, celebrations, trials. It can look like spiritual refreshment or it can look like exhaustion and mundane activities and routines. And for me, this week was, was that last one. It was very full of carting teenage children to and from school and sports and activities and dentist appointments and then taking care of them after their teeth were pulled from said dentist appointment and e-learning and all the good stuff. And I, I said to my husband this morning, I said, I, I really feel like I did not get any quality time with God this week to just worship him and be with him. And he very graciously reminded me that all of life, even taking care of swollen little cheeks, is an opportunity to worship God, is an opportunity to depend on him, to bless his name, to trust in him. And so as we enter into our worship here tonight, wherever you are on your journey, just wanna invite you guys to also depend on the Lord, turn your hearts to trust in him. And would you stand with us now as we lift our voices in song?
the Lord of the Lords, God Almighty. You are holy and righteous. There is none like you. And so we will praise you and worship you in this place. We ask that you would meet with us, that you would speak to us, Father. Reveal your kingdom to us and show us how to follow you, how to journey with you. And Lord, as we give our tithes and our offerings, May they be used to glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, you can take a seat. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Well, hello, 
nights. Good to see everybody and looking forward to being with you here tonight. Uh, We have our online community with us tonight, and so I want to welcome our online community that we are the East Campus, just east on Woodman, uh, just beyond Powers, and we'd love to have you join us or any of the other campuses here uh, at Woodman. Well, tonight, we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 through 16, and so if you want to turn in your Bibles there, and as you're turning there... I'm curious how many of you have ever received one of those birthday cards that whenever you open it up, it has that computer chip and a little speaker in it, and it starts singing happy birthday or says something funny to you or whatever. How how many of you have, 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 yeah, okay, so a lot of you, yeah. So, yeah, I've received a number of those uh, over the years, and typically, you know, you kind of show your family, it's kind of cool, and, um, but, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, I'm just going to throw it away. And, uh, and most of you throw it away, too. Yeah, yeah. And so, do you realize that that, the power of that computer chip, in terms of the power that was in there, it is more than what was on this entire earth before 1950. You realize that? Isn't that crazy when you think about that? And the interesting thing is that, you know, as we look at our computers, our phones, I mean, they're never quite there yet, are they? I mean, keep sending us messages about the upgrade, the next version, the faster, better thing, and it's just never quite there. Well, when we look at the scriptures in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant there, we see that it's never quite there either. It's, a, it's an incomplete system. It anticipates that something greater is going to come uh, from that Old Testament, Old Covenant perspective. I mean, sure... God in those times could be accessed through the sacrificial system. There were animals uh, that were sacrificed so that they could approach God and, and have their sins covered uh, and have enough forgiveness that they could, could pursue God, but it was never quite enough because their sin was only covered. It wasn't actually removed. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 31, he says, The days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with my people and I'll put their law in my mind. And on their hearts. And this new covenant is one of conscience. And there's this anticipation of the new. So as we come to our text, Matthew chapter 26, we come to the apex of the book. And this is one of the most significant, wonderful sections in all of this ancient book here. Because its focus is on the cross of Jesus Christ. And as we anticipate Easter here in a few weeks, and as we think about that Good Friday service when we focus on the cross, and then the, through that weekend right after, we'll be celebrating the Easter resurrection celebration, which is the foundation, the basis, that event, uh, the foundation of, of Christianity. Everything up to the point of the cross is, is what precedes this section in Matthew chapter 26. And so, while we're at the main theme here of the cross, everything else points to it. It's only really the introduction. The primary issue in the revelation of Jesus is about the cross. And so we come to this climax here in Matthew's gospel, the climax of redemptive history, the greatest event in the history of the world, the greatest source of hope in the heart of every man and woman who's ever lived on this earth. It starts with the cross of Christ. The apostle Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Old Testament prophets, they pointed to the cross 600 years prior to his death. And all the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist points to the cross saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This narrative of the cross that we're going to take a look at today, we'll see. You know, we need to, to grapple with the, the historicity of it. That this is an event that actually happened in history. But we're also going to see the theology of it. We're going to see the meaning of the cross in this event. So in Matthew 26, as we look at the preparation of the events leading up to this greatest event that ever happened in the history of the world, we're going to look at four different perspectives as Jesus is moving toward his death by crucifixion. But before we jump into text here, let's just pause and give our time to the Lord. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we open our hearts to you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to inspire us, to draw us to yourself. And I just pray for each one of us here, Lord, that no matter where we might be in our journey with you, Lord, that, that this would just be an opportunity to draw us closer to you, that we might just even take one step closer to you. So we, we commit this next uh, half hour or so to you. We pray that you would use it in our hearts and lives, and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's take a look at verse 1, and this is going to actually establish some of the context and background and setting uh, of our narrative here today. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, let's just, let's just stop right there. Jesus has just finished the Olivet Discourse. And that's what it means here, all of these sayings. That's what he's referring to here in chapter 24 and chapter 25. It's Jesus' great masterful sermon about his own second coming. But having said that, he reminds us that this is the Wednesday before Good Friday. It's been a very long Wednesday before Jesus is actually killed on Friday, on that Good Friday. And in the narrative here, we see that there's just so much that has happened because it actually, this Wednesday starts clear back in chapter 21, verse 23. So you have chapter 21 and 22 and 23 and 24 and 25. Now we're at 26. That's all Wednesday. And so a lot has been happening. It's a very eventful day. And so now, Matthew, he gives us these four perspectives here, and we're going to discover how these perspectives, God uses a part of his amazing plan in the preparation of the death of Christ, that all these things come together precisely at the right moment. So the first perspective is the preparation of Jesus' death according to the plan of God. It's the God's sovereign plan where we see everything coming together in the death of Christ. And we're going to see God's sovereignty throughout this whole narrative. So look at verse 2. Jesus is speaking here. He says, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. You see, the, Jesus had told the disciples several times that he's going to die. And each time he tells them, he tells them he's going to rise again. And we're now here at this culmination, verse 2, and this is the final time. It's the last time Jesus tells them. He says, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And so here, as Matthew's delivering this final scene, what Jesus is saying, the disciples, they're just, they just don't really want to believe it. And he says it here for the last time, and they're going to see it. I mean, it's going to happen in two days, whether they want to or not. And so here we see the sovereign plan of God in action in this verse when it says the Son of Man will be delivered up. It's communicating that all that happens, it's all in God's timing. It's not man's timing. So let me just briefly address, there's been books that have been written about this. You may have heard there's one popular one called The Passover Plot. And these books propose that the death of Christ is thought to just be an accident. They say things like, you know, he was a well-meaning revolutionary whose revolution went south, and so he just ended up getting himself killed. And the religious leaders and others have been trying to kill Jesus from the very beginning, but they've been so unsuccessful that this is not the case at all because Jesus and God have this whole thing in control. I mean, in fact, John 10 says, you remember what Jesus said here? He said, no man takes my life from me Rather, I lay it down myself, of myself. I have authority to lay it down. There's so many attempts to take Jesus' life. I mean, it's really hard to believe that this is a revelation that's gone bad. Let me just give you, just quickly, some examples uh, throughout the Gospels to remind you of some of the times that his life was threatened. So, of course, the first one was when he was born, right, with Herod. I mean, Herod tried to eliminate, he massacred all the babies under two years old just to get rid of Jesus, and he escapes. Then there was a time in Nazareth when Jesus said, I'm the Messiah. So he took him out to the edge of the cliff to try to throw him over the cliff, and he disappears in their midst. He was at the pool of Bethesda. He healed the man there, and immediately, because he did it on the Sabbath, they tried to kill him, and he escapes. During the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jewish leaders, they send the temple police to capture Jesus, to execute him. And they came back without Jesus. And all they could say was, never has a man spoken like that. I mean, they were so overwhelmed with Jesus' words, they, they come back without him. I mean, it just kind of makes you chuckle, doesn't it? It's amazing. 
And then John 10, he's walking on the porch of Solomon in the temple. And the Jews picked up stones to stone him right there. And he miraculously escapes. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And he created such an uprising that the Jewish leaders, they put an edict out to seize him and they can't find him anywhere. Every time he claimed equality with God, they went into a frenzy to take him out. And they just couldn't get it done. And so all these so-called attempts on his life were unsuccessful because it wasn't God's time. It wasn't God's timetable. But now, in our story, it is God's timing for Jesus to die. And as Jesus predicts, it's going to happen in two days. He's going to be crucified on the day of the Passover. Now, just another thought about this, that whenever Jesus was standing before Pilate, In John 19, right before his crucifixion, do you remember what he said? He said, you would have no authority at all unless it had been given to you from above. Again, God's sovereignty. So if there's ever a time that the Jews didn't didn't want him to be killed, it was during the Passover. Did you realize that? I mean, this is the time when God wants it done. But these Jewish leaders are like, no, 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 no. We don't want to do this on the Passover. In fact, if we just jump ahead for a minute to verse 5, they say, the Jewish leaders say, but they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. I mean, they say, if we do it now, there's going to be a riot among the people. I mean, many of these people, they're coming from Jerusalem for the Passover. They're coming from Galilee, and they're, they're enamored by Jesus. I mean, they're fascinated. They're, they're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hailing him as a Messiah. I mean, they know that he's a miracle worker, that he's healing the sick, that he's giving sight to the blind and to the deaf, and he's raising the dead. And Jesus, he was just too popular to touch. It was too volatile. And these Jewish leaders, they're afraid of the mob. Well, Passover was a big deal in Jerusalem. Huge crowds of people. According to Josephus, the ancient historian, at one Passover season, one, one census reports that 256,000 lambs were killed. Josephus says the law stated that there could be no less than 10 people per lamb. It was a celebration of community. Nobody celebrated the Passover alone. So if you have a minimum of 10 people per lamb, there's roughly, what, 2.5 million people at least that are swelling into Jerusalem. And priests, they would kill the lambs in a two-hour period. There were hundreds of priests. It's estimated that they would, they would kill roughly two lambs per minute per priest. I mean, I mean that's like better than Chick-fil-A drive through isn't it? I mean, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? That was, it was a huge ritual. Well, these Jewish leaders, I mean, they were afraid also of the Romans. As if a riot was started... The Romans would move in with their military power. It would mess up the political peace. It would actually even mess up the opportunity and and forfeit possibly the opportunity for them to kill Jesus. What's interesting is when all the Jews would be celebrating their Passover, when lambs were being sacrificed all over the place, Jesus would be offered up as the Lamb of God. I mean, what a fitting moment, right? Right? What perfect timing the sovereign God has planned for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world that he'd be sacrificed on Passover when all these lambs that couldn't take away the sin were being killed. It was the unchangeable plan of God in his sovereignty that God just overturns the plans of man. I mean, they want to kill Jesus so bad, and they can't. And just when they can't, God says, that's when we're going to do it. And the interesting thing is, it's so symbolic, isn't it? I mean, it's just such perfect timing. I don't know about you, it's just mind-boggling to me. It's really, really amazing to see God's sovereignty. Well, that's the first perspective, and that perspective is going to really run through this entire narrative as we move through it together. The second perspective is that of the Jewish leaders and their hatred toward Jesus, verses 3 through 5. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, 
and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So the Sanhedrin, they call this special meeting at the palace of Caiaphas. Uh, it's the chief priests, it's most likely the scribes, it's the elders of the people, they're the, the representatives of the families, the noble families especially, the aristocrats, the, the wealthy. They'd all had one thing in mind. How might they take Jesus by deceit and kill him? Once again, they're, they're plotting his death, only this time it is going to come to pass, but not the way that they thought it was going to come to plan, pass. Not according to their plan, but God's plan. And this ruling body, I mean, by now, they've just had more of Jesus than they can stand. I mean, they had been intimidated by him beyond just anything they could possibly stand. And Caiaphas, I mean, he is so insecure. In fact, a little background on Caiaphas. Josephus tells us his real name is jo Joseph Caiaphas. And he was just a wretched, vile, conniving, treacherous, wicked, deceitful man. I mean, he's pictured in Scripture really as a one-dimensional person. Because all you see him doing is trying to kill Jesus. That's all his focus is. I'm about killing Jesus. And he's driven by his own ego, his own satisfaction. He has no sense of justice or truth or righteousness or what is fair, or what is good. He's all about himself. He doesn't really care about the people. And ordinarily, this office of high priest, typically that comes through the Levitical line, but that went by the wayside. Caiaphas, he was able to get around that. He was able to buy his way through marriage into this role as high priest. And he was in charge. There was no king in Israel at this time. And he had more power than anybody else. And he wanted to use that power to get rid of Jesus. He was the ultimate symbol of that religious system in Israel. I mean, even in his decadence and power, yet he was in this role where he carried out all the priestly functions. I mean, he was, the, he was the only one who was allowed to go into the Holy Holies at the Day of Atonement. He had to carry out all the leadership of all the sacrifices and all the ceremonies and all the rituals. It was all on him. And so we see this hateful rejection of Jesus in these verses. And we know that under God's sovereignty, that this was a part of the preparation of Jesus for the cross. That was a part of his plan. And of course, as we'll see in a few minutes, Judas became their ticket. He became the portrayer. And we understand that in order for the Savior to be crucified, that it had to be done by hateful men. I mean, Jesus was just such a threat to their whole system, to their whole, whole way of life. I mean, he called them whitewashed tombs. All this culmination, all this hatred just reached a fever pitch. And, we're and, and they were just moving right in line with the, the sovereignty of God in terms of his plan and pulling it all together. Well, the third perspective is of Mary and her loving adoration of worship of Jesus. Take a look at verse 6. It reads, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. And pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. What she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is a beautiful scene. It's the preparation of Jesus on his way to the cross through loving and adoring worship. Jumping back here to verse 6. It says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, Simon the leper, he invites Jesus as a guest for this nice dinner. However, Simon the leper was no longer a leper because if he was, nobody's going to come to his house for dinner. In fact, leprosy in that day could not be healed. The only way that leprosy was ever healed was by Jesus. And it's pretty obvious that Simon was the recipient of the healing power of Christ. One way he could show his gratitude to Christ was, was to offer this special, special dinner. 
And all the excitement around this would just be unspeakable. They wouldn't believe him. And here he is, Simon the leper. Wow, in his, you know, he's been healed. He's the outcast of outcasts. And now having the healer God in human flesh in his own home and hosting him, it would be so exciting. And he's inviting Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and Lazarus who was raised from the dead, to be a part of the 12 and the disciples. I mean, it's just this great meal of like 20-some people. All the gospel writers, they all include this uh, in their narrative because it's a very important occasion. It's important because there's an anointing. We don't have time to go into all the details of all the gospel accounts, but I want you to see what happens here in verse 7. They're in this house in Bethany, and it's a lovely evening of gratitude. Lazarus is alive. Jesus is there. There's Mary and her sister Martha. And Martha is busy serving, and Mary is busy sitting at the feet of Jesus learning. I mean, she had this aptitude for divine truth. And Jesus says about Mary of Bethany, she has chosen the better part. The worship is better than service. That There she is, sitting at the feet of her Savior. And then all of a sudden, verse 7 bursts upon us. A woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And we know that this is Mary of Bethany from the other accounts. That's how we know this. And the, and the kind of oil that Mary was pouring was very expensive. It's called oil of spikenard. It's from northern India. And it has a fibrous root that's anywhere from 3 inches to 12 inches long. It would shoot out about 30 to 40 spikes per plant. And at the end of each of these spikes, there are little oil pods of an earthy, fragrant oil that would be used for ritual baths and, and for burials. And so Mary, she comes to Jesus, and she has this bottle that's made out of this alabaster material. It's very thin alabaster. It's a very transparent type material. And it would be very fat and round at the, bottle, but then at the bottom, but then it would have a skinny neck. And at the top of the neck, it would be corked or it would, it would be closed off to, to, to hold in this precious spikenard perfume. And most scholars would say that it was worth a year's wages. Mark tells us it's 300 denarii. Our pastor Matt Farrow over at Rock Rim, and he calculated it would be worth around $30,000. The point is, it's, it's very, very costly. And you might ask, you know, why, why did she have it? I mean, most likely it came from a very wealthy family. But it was customary in those days, if, if you had guests for a meal, to anoint them with some type of perfume. In those days, I mean, let's face it, they didn't have deodorant. And so they'd be out and about tramping around the dirt with their sandals and their robes and getting a little sweaty. And you come to the end of the day and you're invited in for a meal. And so they didn't have the means for cleanliness like we do nowadays. And so you come in as a guest and you just hope somebody's going to give you something, you know, perfume, oil, something to help you out. Now, this reminds me of a story of the guys who were all packed into the car driving, and somebody said, well, one of you hasn't used your deodorant. To which one fellow replied, well, it isn't me. I never use any. <laughs> well, that's the way it was in this time period. Nobody used deodorant. And, and it was just a common thing to use this strong perfume uh, in the home, especially around mealtime. So we find that Mary can't refrain herself. She's been sitting at the feet of Jesus. The disciples are still not grasping what's, what's going to happen here, that Jesus is going to die. I don't know if there's some denial going on here or just what. But Mary understands that Jesus is moving toward his death. And maybe she remembers his predictions about his death and resurrection. I don't know. But somehow it's in her mind that this is it. This is her opportunity. And she wants to prepare him for this. And this is the preparation of loving worship here. And if you compare Mark's account and John's account, she shatters the whole bottle. It says in Matthew here in verse 7, she poured it on his head. John says she poured it on his feet. I mean, the sum of which she really poured it all over him, right? She covered him, the whole thing, all 12 ounces of spikenard, of this costly perfume that takes a year's worth of wages to earn. I mean, what in the world made her do that? It's an act of love. It's an act of honor. She was absolutely adoring Jesus. 
and so absolutely controlled by worship, she just couldn't have any restraint. Have you ever been in those moments of worship where you just lose all sense of time? You totally lose track of time. Mary was pouring out her love, her heart of compassion, her devotion. She was honoring the one that was going to die and who's going to rise again. And for her, she knew that her salvation was because of what he was doing for her. And you know, I think she did it for you and for me. She symbolizes the effusive, profuse, magnanimous outpouring of love that God desires from every single one of us. And let me say, I get to see that in some of you here. You know, it's just fun for me as I get to connect with a lot of you just to see your own passion of worship, to see you and your life and how you do life and and, and just how you're generous and how you just want to pour out your love to Jesus. And I was thinking about that because for those of you online who don't know, we, we're in the middle of this building campaign. And so it just gives me an opportunity as I interact with you to see how many of you are responding to this. And of course, you know, there's a huge need, a legitimate need to, to have this space for the next generation. But I just see your heart for worship. I see that it's not the need necessarily that's driving you. It's because of what God has done in your heart and life that you just want to give back. You just want to be generous. You just can't help yourself. You're just thinking, I am, I'm so grateful for this relationship and for what God has done for me that I just can't restrain myself. I want to take what I have, and Lord Jesus, I just want to pour it out on you. It's just unrestrained, unmitigated, effusive love of adoring worship that knows no boundaries. And that's why we come together every weekend too, right? To come together to give our hearts out of gratitude, to thank the Lord for what he has done for us. That's why we have these nights of worship like we're gonna have this week. It's to show our heart and our gratitude for him. Well, I hate to say it, but I think I might have responded like the disciples did here, verse eight. Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. I mean, that seems so noble, doesn't it? Judas made this suggestion not because he cared about the poor, but because he held the bag. In other words, the money would have never made it to the poor. It would have been sold for the 300 denarii and stuck in Judas's robe. I mean, he knew the whole time this thing is coming to an end. I mean, he's, he's disillusioned. He knows he's not going to be a part of this new kingdom. He's going to get every dime that he can get. And when Jesus perceived this, he said to them, why are you troubling this woman? In other words, why are you putting burdens on her? I mean, literally he's saying, why are you making her feel bad? Why are you making her feel guilty, like as if she's doing something wrong here? He's saying, this is an excellent, outwardly beautiful, magnificent, lovely thing that she is doing. And then he says this in verse 11, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now don't misunderstand this. Jesus is not endorsing poverty here or that we should be apathetic to human suffering. We're always going to have the poor and Jesus and the apostles are very careful that we need to meet the needs of the poor. He's not overturning that teaching. But he's saying it's a question of priority. He's addressing a divine stewardship here. And he's saying this is time and this is a time for worship. That there's a, a legitimate time for charity, there's a legitimate time for philanthropy, and there's also a legitimate time for worship. But I think what we're seeing here in this passage is the combination of the two, that, that often our generosity comes out of our worship. That they go together, that, that it's an outflow of what's going on in our heart and our love for our Lord and our Savior. And Jesus says it's not a time for pragmatism. It's not a time to be practical. I mean, we... As Americans, I mean, it's easy for us to be practical. And there's times for that, right? But Mary is doing something here for her Lord that she's never going to have the opportunity to do again right before his death. And she is extravagant in how she pours out this gift on Jesus. And there's thir certain things in this life that we will never have the opportunity again after we pass from this earth to make an internal impact here on this earth. I mean, once we go to the grave, we're not gonna be able to give to the kingdom ever again. 
Once, we're, once we move on from this earth, never again are we going to be able to share the gospel message. I mean, when we go to heaven, like, are we going to be evangelizing Peter, James, and John? No, I don't think so. They're already there. We'll be there. It's now. Now is the time that we have certain opportunities to use our resources, to use our story, to use our connections, to share the gospel, to use our resources for the sake of the kingdom that will last for eternity. Well, verse 12, Jesus says, in pouring out this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. This was an act of preparation, knowing what, she, what he was about to go through. This was her way of showing her love to him, a devoted follower who sat at his feet. She was essentially giving him the roses before the funeral. The term Jesus uses here in pouring this ornament, it's a very strong term. It's a lavish, profuse pouring. And then Jesus says in verse 13, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So wherever the good news is proclaimed, you're going to remember what this woman did. It's a memorial that he sets up of her loving worship. It's because it's such a beautiful testimony, isn't it? And here we are. 2,000 years later, seeing this amazing, sacrificial, selfless worship from this very dear lady who demonstrated her love of Jesus in what many would call extreme and unnecessary. Well, quickly, the fourth perspective. The fourth and final perspective is of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what would you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. I mean, Judas wasn't going to get the 300 denarii for the perfume, so he was still out to get as much as he could. What will you give me if I turn in Jesus to you? He set up the betrayer, looking for the moment when he could turn Jesus in. And while Jesus is receiving this love from Mary, Judas begins in his mind to, to plot how it is he's going to turn Jesus in. And his motive is just money, money, money. You know, I think Judas is one of the greatest examples of a lost opportunity that we would have ever known. I mean, just think about it. The time he spent with Jesus... And he comes to the end of his life. What a lost opportunity. King Louis XII, the king of France, he wasn't always the king. He had enemies. And before he ascended to the throne, he was a prisoner and he was kept there by his enemies. He was eventually released and coordinated and his enemies were in morbid fear that the king was going to wipe them all out. In fact, All of the king's advisors told him that he should kill them all. They sinned against you. They tried to hurt you. They they put you in prison. So King Louis, he decided that he was going to have a document written up of all the names of his enemies, all the people who committed crimes against him. And on this document, beside every name, he would put a red cross beside their name. And whenever his enemies heard about this document... They were certain this was their death warrant. The red signifies blood. They're going to die. And so he rounds up all his enemies. And he shows them the document. And he said, the red cross doesn't represent punishment. But remembrance. It's a remembrance for you and for me that Jesus forgave all of his enemies. And so I'm proclaiming to you that you're all pardoned. As your king, you are forgiven. And he wanted that cross to be there by their names as a reminder, not only that he was forgiven by the blood of Jesus, his Savior, but that he would extend that forgiveness to those who sinned against him. You know, we're all marked men and women. We're marked for death. The Apostle Paul says, For all sin and fall short of the glory of God, the wages of sin is death. But there can be a red cross written by your name if you put your faith and trust in what the Lord Jesus did in dying on the cross for you 
And if you believe that he rose from the dead, you can live with him forever, for eternity. And if you have that faith and trust, your heavenly father will pardon you. You will be forgiven and you'll be able to live with him forever. But we all have that choice to be either marked for eternal life or marked for death. You know, as I close, there's three ways that we can approach Jesus that we learn from this narrative, from, from the perspectives that we took a look at as we think about his death and resurrection. We could be like Caiaphas, that hateful rejection, the high priest where you can deny Jesus, you can ignore him, you can reject him. Or we can be like Mary. We can stand with her, that loving worship, that generous heart of worship for Jesus. Or we can, we can act like Judas. That we can act like we're about the ways of God, but we're really not. We, if we stand with Jesus, we might claim to love Jesus, but it's not legit. We claim to belong, but we're hypocrites. Some hate, some truly love, some pretend. And so we're going to take a moment. We're going to have a time of reflection. And I just want to give you the opportunity just to reflect on your relationship with Jesus. And what is it that he's speaking to you about here? Is there just some step that you need to take toward him? Is there perhaps something that you need to do that's going to help you in your walk and to grow closer to him? Do you need to take that step and for the first time put your faith and trust in him? And so let's just pause for a minute. I'll pray now and give you some time to reflect. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for the hope we have through the death and resurrection of Jesus. I mean, what an amazing event uh, in history where you brought your son on this earth to die for us, for our sins, so we can have forgiveness and that we can have a relationship with you. So Lord, I just pray that uh, just even during these next few moments, that you might move in our hearts, that your spirit would just guide us, perhaps inspire us, convict us, whatever it might be, whatever steps we need to make toward you. I pray that you would lead us in this time now. Lord, we just want to worship you. We want to thank you for who you are. We want to have hearts that are so big, that are so just led by you and your spirit. Lord, help us to, to be loving and to be generous and to be kind and to, to just live for you. So we pray for this time. We thank you for this time together. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. All things have passed.
our first in our hearts, God. Whether it's our voices, our finances, our time, our talents, when we take that and lay it at the feet of Jesus and say, for all that you've done and all that you are, here, I bring this to you. He looks at it and says, it's beautiful. And so may we continue to worship him and him alone and may we live the intentional life pointing others, people, to the beauty of Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is by practicing gratitude for who he is, what he has done. And so I'm praying that this week, this week, a Sabbath that we're entering into is a time to worship him, to fix your eyes and your heart. We would love for you to gather with us on Wednesday night as we gather to do just that to praise his name in song, to pray for one another, promises to be a rich evening. If there are ways that we could pray for you, rejoice with you, help hold you accountable to what perhaps the Lord has laid on your heart this week or this, this weekend. We have pastors and leaders up front. If you're joining us online, let us know. We'd love to create an environment of prayer in these rooms before we head out to what is next. So pray with those around you, your family and your friends. We'd love to pray with you up front. But as you go, receive these words. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. Go in his grace. Go in his peace.